So this story time is long overdue. It's been almost three years to the date since the day that I put in my first leave of absence from Stanford and there's a lot to talk about. I don't know how long this video will be, but in this video I'll be explaining how Stanford became the dream school that I wanted to attend in the first place, how I guaranteed myself getting into Stanford, the unique experience I had at Stanford grad school, ultimately why I decided to stop, and finally whether or not I regret that decision today. Let's just get right into it. So yeah, the Stanford dream. The inkling first began sophomore year of high school. I toured Stanford with my family, and as this sports-loving kid who was also doing pretty well academically, the thought of a well-rounded school like Stanford was really intriguing. I like the idea of being able to root for a D1 sports team and be around that atmosphere, but then also have a school that was top notch in terms of their engineering curriculum. And of course, Stanford offers both of those. So fast forward to senior year. At this point, I had no idea what caliber of student I was in high school, and I didn't know how I compared amongst my peers, and didn't know where I fell under the tiers of colleges that were. So I applied to different state schools, I applied to UCs, and ultimately I applied to what we'd consider as the top-notch schools like the Ivy League and MIT and Georgia Tech. I really had no idea where I fell, so I was just casting a wide net at that point. But fast forward to March, at this point, I had already gotten a presidential scholarship from USC. I'd already gotten designated as a potential Eggleston scholar at Columbia University, and I'd gotten also early into Cornell. Mind you, I applied regular decision to everywhere, but for these specific universities, I got calls from people at their admissions department already telling me that I was a likely admit to those universities. And I think at this point, I had also even gotten into Harvard and MIT just through their regular decision process. So it was at this point where my mom actually planned a trip up to Stanford because she saw that I'd gotten into, you know, MIT, Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, all of these schools in the Northeast. And I think this was her last ditch effort of trying to remind me of how great of a school Stanford is and also that it's drivable and that we can just go there at any time. And so on the trip up to Northern California for that weekend, it was actually on the drive up that I got the news that Stanford had waitlisted me. And at this point in my head, I was already pretty set on going to MIT because I had already visited there and I really resonated with their mission, the way that the curriculum works and just everything about it. So I was sit on MIT. This was a trip for my mom to try to convince me to go to Stanford last minute, but with the wait list, I immediately took myself off the wait list and I just declared MIT. And while at the time I felt fine, of course, because I had already gotten to a lot of places and I felt good with where I was, that feeling of what if always lingered in the back of my head. As I mentioned before, I love sports. I decided not to pursue sports at MIT and realistically MIT sports paled in comparison to Stanford's. The thought of having again, the D1 sports team to root for the caliber of Stanford's really intrigued me. And I had already, you know, put so much effort into the academics and building that foundation foundation at MIT that I thought I wanted a little bit more of a well-rounded experience at somewhere like Stanford. On top of all this, throughout my time at MIT, I got even more interested in entrepreneurship and startups, and at the time, Silicon Valley was still far and away the startup capital of the world. So the thought of continuing my education somewhere amidst successful founders and successful startups really intrigued me. That was really one of the main driving factors of wanting to go to Stanford. And after I did research there the summer of 2019, I was sure that Stanford was where I wanted to be after my time at MIT. So by the time I got to actually apply to graduate school, I had my eyes solely set on Stanford. It was either getting into Stanford engineering grad school or find a job and I wasn't going to do grad school altogether. So how did I guarantee my grad school admission? Let's rewind a couple of years to my sophomore year at MIT. At this point, I applied to this program called Laureates and Leaders, which was meant to help people with applying to grad school and even figure out if grad school was what they wanted to pursue. I ended up getting into that program, but I'll get back to how this helped me later. At this point, I wanted to just get into the program in case that I wanted to do grad school in the future. I wasn't set on it, but I got in. The summer of 2018, I was interning at this large aerospace company called Northrop Grumman. It was my second internship role there, and frankly, I wasn't excited about the work. 
the pace of work and the bureaucracy involved with climbing the ladder in terms of positions and roles. So it was at that point where I felt like grad school was definitely the route that I wanted to take. If anything, it would buy me time to figure things out for the future while, you know, I continue to learn more and more in the best environment possible. And at the time I thought that, okay, if I do complete whatever advanced degrees that I get, I'll just be automatically considered one of the more senior engineers when I leave. And I'll just get that respect and don't have to work for years trying to build up engineer one, engineer two, engineer three. So it was that summer where I actually started to put things in motion. I used the connections from laureates and leaders to get in contact with the head of diversity and inclusion at Stanford. That person who still follows all my socials to this day helped set up a tour of the aerospace engineering department. Simultaneously, as she was setting up the tours for me, I had been cold emailing different Stanford professors, using my MIT email, seeing if any of them would allow me to tour their labs. Turned out one of them replied and let me tour when I visited. So again, I went up to Stanford with my family, was able to tour the campus as a whole, and the lab that that professor ran that emailed me back. I used the face-to-face -face time here to ask for future research opportunities that the lab had to offer, and ultimately he said that he was open for me doing research in the lab, but that I needed additional funding and he didn't know if he could guarantee that. So in my head, the goal quickly became get funding and I can secure an internship research opportunity at Stanford. So fast forward to the next school year. Throughout the year, laureates and leaders lets us know about different summer research opportunities. And when one of them was Stanford, I knew it was my chance to jump on that. The program in question was Stanford's SURF program. And this is a really selective program with only about 20 people every year. And it guaranteed funding and research opportunities for the course of the summer. So of course, <laughs> this is exactly what I needed. I applied to the program. I even told told them that I knew this one professor that would allow me to do research in their lab, included the fact that I really wanted to pursue a graduate school at Stanford even beyond uh, my undergraduate career at MIT. And I ended up getting into the program and becoming one of the 20 selected. The funding involved wasn't a typical paycheck. Like if you were interning at a company, it ended up being funding for housing and food purposes, and then a couple thousand dollars stipend just for actually living in Palo Alto and being able to like go out to eat and stuff. The biggest value add from this whole experience outside of the connections that I made at Stanford was the research that I got to do inside of the lab. So I got to work in this smart structures lab in their aerospace engineering grad school department and I got to work with an aerospace grad student himself and got to work on really cool research where I got to get my hands dirty and actually work in a research setting at Stanford. And it was at this point where I was able to get some experience under my belt, show what I was capable of, and at the end of the program was able to ask for a letter of rec from that initial professor that I emailed way back when asking to tour his lab. So at this point, it went all full circle. And I think that was the last missing piece to my Stanford graduate school application that pretty much guaranteed my admission. My grades were in a great place. I had research opportunity under my belt in three different labs across MIT and Stanford. And now I have great letters of recommendation across MIT and Stanford as well. So this really tied the loop up. And yeah, at that point, I was feeling really confident. I was actually starting to wear this shirt around MIT even before I officially applied because I knew that I had guaranteed my admission. So the Stanford grad school experience, it was definitely definitely not what I had expected. Of course, the broader context here is that we were going through the initial portions of the pandemic. So everything was fully closed. Everything was fully remote. That meant no gyms at Stanford, no classrooms, no libraries, no basketball courts or dining halls. Everything that I had grown to love at Stanford, I had no access to. And to top all this off, I was still paying full tuition despite having no real Stanford amenities to take advantage of. And at the time, if you've been following me, you know that I've also been very involved with this autonomous drone startup at the time and I was one of the lead engineers pushing things forward. And my YouTube channel was also growing at a really good rate where I was approaching 100,000 subscribers. Both the drone company and YouTube were just things that were more exciting to me at the time than remote Stanford grad school was. At the time, I had this whole separate apartment that was close to campus, but was off campus. It was good to have my own space to grind and push my business endeavors forward, but it was also 
pretty isolating and in hindsight, I'm not sure if that's something that I would have done again. In terms of the actual classes, it was just one quarter and the first quarter was more intro grad classes that overlapped conceptually with a lot of the things that I learned at MIT anyway. And that meant that I didn't have to put too much effort into the classes, which again, may have been a detriment on my end where I just never was fully into it. I didn't hate studying at Stanford. It's just, I was more excited about the other aspects of my life at the time. And I wanted to put my time pretty much anywhere else. So why did I drop out? Well, the winter break after my first quarter at Stanford, I get word that a conversational AI startup that I helped form was about to demo their product to investors. Before this, I had just known the founders. I actually introduced them together and knew that they were building a cool product, but I was really focused on YouTube and the drone company and Stanford, so. I had no business to putting more onto my plate at the time. And because I was and still am really good friends with the CTO of that company at the time, he introduced me to the CEO and wanted me to give actual product advice. The product advice that they wanted was just to help them form a cohesive demo that would be good to pitch to investors. But when it came out that I could actually code, they put me straight into the weeds and I dove into the project and actually contributed some pretty valuable stuff right away. And we ultimately ended up getting the funding as a company. So shortly after we got that investment, the CEO had a call with me and basically said that a full-time job was on the table if I wanted to take it. And at the time, I already discussed, you know, how Stanford was feeling, how I was feeling about my other endeavors. And with this specific startup, I just had this really great feeling that I was working with a phenomenal team on a fantastic project. So I decided to substitute in my life Stanford or this startup and still continue with the drone company and YouTube, but then now have this other full-time position. All people involved were aware of the different positions that I had, but I guess the value that I provided was enough for everyone to feel comfortable involved. And at the time with YouTube quickly approaching 100,000 subscribers, the drone company I was a part of looking very promising and guaranteed salary from this company that I just helped with a demo, there was just too many great things pulling me away from Stanford at the time. So at that moment, which was actually three years years almost to this day. I took a temporary leave of absence because I wanted the option to return if I wanted to. But at the time, I think it was very clear to me that my heart was in the entrepreneurial and startup worlds and not with Stanford grad school. So yeah, it's been three years since I submitted that leave of absence form and have since officially dropped out, of course. Is that something that I regret? Well, let me give you a little bit more context. So, so between now and then, I got really sick, contracting two autoimmune diseases. Both startups ended up falling apart in pretty major fashion that hit me hard. Financially, I hit my rock bottom because as the startups fell apart, my health also fell apart, so I couldn't do the things that I was used to doing. I didn't even feel comfortable coming on camera. So yeah, everything sucked around that time. But ultimately, I don't regret dropping out. I'm grateful for all the experience I gained over the last three years, and right now, I'd still be in the middle of my PhD research journey, and that blows my mind because I don't think I'm built for that type of sustained research without being able to, you know, push my different products forward or have my different business ventures and basically living on the salary that I do now. It just feels weird thinking about grad school at this point in my life. Along the way, I also learned a ton about myself. I've had once in a lifetime experiences and ultimately have been able to follow my heart in all of this. I was able to have fancy dinners with investors, step in as CEO when our CEO got sick, build products that were conceptually built in my head. And that's just things that I'm so grateful to be able to say at just 25 years of age. And not everything's doom and gloom also. Over the past year or so, I was able to leverage that knowledge that I gained through those different startups. And with my latest job, I was hired as a software engineer, just basic level, already got two promotions within a year to senior software engineer. And that was very validating for me at a post series A startup that was a little bit more established and now is about to get their next round of funding. I was able to prove myself among a larger team. And outside of actual work, I was also able to package all this knowledge and experience into both my social platforms, 
for people to consume this for free. At Aspire Mentors, my fellow MIT alumni mentors and I are able to more personally guide the mentees and throughout the year, we're able to just provide so much value to their lives. If this is something that interests you, head over to aspirementors.tech apply to learn more and to book a call with me to actually see if you're the right fit for this program. But yeah, that's all I had to say today. That was quite a long-winded video. I don't know how long it is, but I think it was very much overdue. Hopefully this gave you a bit more context about what was happening in my head, how I viewed the whole process and everything in between. If there's anything that resonated with you in this video specifically, let me know in the comment section and I'll stick around for a bit to chat with all of you because I love hearing from you firsthand. And if you aren't already, make sure to subscribe because I post six to eight times a month and post shorts daily. So I'd love to have you part of this journey. As always, stay positive, stay inspired, and I'll see you in the next one.